Hey, I'm Caleb Howard, and welcome to Tales from Sacred Texts. Just a quick disclaimer, there is a decent amount of content regarding intimacy between men and women, mostly the condemnation of it, to a ludicrously ridiculous extent. If that's a problem for you, please either go and listen to the first part of Tobit, or, if you've already heard it, please come back next week to finish the story. The weekly stories won't contain as much potentially objectionable content. These bonus episodes were my chance to tell a couple darker stories. This is the second bonus episode that I'm releasing in honor of this podcast dropping, and we're going to be doing the story of Peter and Simon Magus, Apocrypha style. You'll learn that Peter committed crimes that would have made John Wick go, well, John Wick, how to take down a guy who was pulled through the sky on a chariot driven by demons, and that paralyzing a woman so that she can't have sex is probably the best thing for her. I'd like to quickly explain the sources for this story. We're mostly pulling from the Acts of Peter and the writings of the Nicene Fathers, in particular Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril of Jerusalem was a well-known church father and allegedly the Bishop of Jerusalem. Although the term bishop originally meant different than what it is now, so to what extent this position would be recognizable is debatable, and he was declared a saint by the Catholic, Eastern, and Oriental, we're talking Egypt, Armenia, and Ethiopia, Orthodox, and Anglican churches. The Acts of Peter is in a different category of the Apocrypha than Tobit. The first category consists of stories that are believable at best, at least somewhat congruous to the Protestant biblical canon at worst. These books in the Apocrypha are written in a similar style to more widely accepted canonical books and often reference Protestant canon books quite accurately. These books include Tobit, the Maccabees, Judith, Apocryphal Daniel, and the Book of Wisdom, which has a name that's pretty on the nose. Yeah, these books contain what may be viewed as some pretty weird stuff, but they're not totally off the wall and are accepted by the Catholic and, usually, Orthodox churches. The second category, which includes the Acts of Peter, Epistle of Pseudotitus, possibly one of the worst books in terms of content ever written, and I do not say that lightly, the Apocalypse of Peter, First Clement, and the Shepherd of Hermas. These are quite fascinating, but often amount to little more than glorified fan fiction. They often directly contradict both Protestant and Catholic canons and are not accepted by any major religion. Let me know if you want to do an episode just commenting on the problems with these books, because I'd love to do it. Anyway, I'm super fascinated by a lot of Christian church dynamics and legends of saints and the evolution of belief in different countries, so I've got to talk in quite a bit. If you'd like me to do some bonus episodes on different historical figures, saints, etc., please let me know and I'll consider it. All right, I'm just going to shut up and get on with the story. Peter was tired of hearing all the guys talk about his daughter. They couldn't help it. His daughter was so hot and paralyzed. Peter, you've healed us all but left your daughter paralyzed? This really didn't make sense. She was so good looking. She was a virgin and she believed in God. This was great. Peter should just heal her. Peter gestured toward his daughter and she stood up, immediately becoming unparalyzed. She flipped her hair and Peter waved his hands. That was too much. Go back and be paralyzed again, Peter said. The daughter rolled her eyes. Do I have to? Peter said nothing and pointed back at the spot. The daughter rolled her eyes again. Peter didn't get it. Didn't his daughter understand? Her being paralyzed was better for both him and for her. That was debatable. But she didn't dare challenge her father with all his evil dark magic powers, so she sat down again and instantly became paralyzed. The guys weren't happy. This was not cool. Magic was not supposed to be used to paralyze attractive young women who would otherwise be marriageable. Actually, that was the purpose of it. It was really great that she was paralyzed. The men were looking at Peter like he was some kind of horrible father. Peter was exasperated. Why are you looking at me like that? Listen, 
I'll just tell you the whole story. Peter had just had a daughter and he was overjoyed. It was great to have a daughter. He smiled as he patted her head. He went to bed and began to contentedly sleep when God appeared to him and said, and quote, This day is a great temptation born to thee, for this daughter will bring hurt unto many souls if her body continue whole. Basically, your daughter is going to tempt many men and make them go to hell because she's really good looking. Peter wasn't sure about that. God, if they're sinning because they're looking at her and thinking dirty thoughts, isn't that their fault? Are we going to force men and women to live separately where they might never see someone of the opposite sex and be tempted to lust? That's absolutely what I want to do, God said. It's a few hundred years out, but we're getting there. It will be sin-proof. Peter shook his head. God was just being a jerk. He forgot about it. Ten years later, a creepy rich dude became obsessed with Peter's daughter, having seen her bathing. This is such a trope in the Bible slash Apocrypha that people should have known not to let their elementary school daughters take baths. Somebody might decide they want to marry them. The ancient world was a disgusting place. Peter was grossed out. She hasn't even gone through puberty yet. That's disgusting and immoral. I've been waiting a long time, the creepy rich dude said, a lot longer than I should have. I could have asked earlier, but I decided to be nice. That's absolutely not nice. She hasn't even reached the age of consent in Japan yet. It's 13, by the way. Age of consent? The creepy man was puzzled. What was that? What even is consent, the creepy rich man said as his slaves grabbed Peter's daughter and carried her away kicking and screaming. And then she suddenly stopped kicking and screaming. There was terror in her eyes, though. She had realized she couldn't move. The rich man realized this, too. Most women kicked and screamed more. What was wrong with this girl? Then he noticed. Half of her body was withered and gross. Oh, she was paralyzed. That was a real buzzkill. He dropped her back at the door of her house. He couldn't do anything to her. She wasn't attractive enough anymore. Dad, why didn't you just use the dark magic on him that you're about to unleash on Simon Magus? Peter shrugged. He preferred paralyzing his daughter. That was probably more fair. There'd be many more men who couldn't control themselves, and would he really have to strike them all dead? That wouldn't be fair to the men. Just in case you want to know what happened to the creepy man, he cried so much because he couldn't have sex with Peter's daughter that he went blind. God told him to go to Peter and that trying to have sex with Peter's daughter was actually pretty gross. Peter healed him, but the guy was so old that he didn't have much longer left to live and he kicked the bucket pretty quickly, leaving Peter a plot of land. Wow, really makes up for everything he tried to do, Peter's daughter absolutely did not say. A few weeks later, Peter was at the home of a gardener. The gardener had one child, a daughter, and the gardener kept begging Peter to pray for her. Peter was absolutely happy to do that and immediately said a prayer. There was a flash of lightning and the girl fell dead. The father screamed and wailed. What did you do? That was horrible and awful. It was his only daughter. Peter shrugged. It was good that she was dead. Now she couldn't have sex with anyone. What? This was completely terrible. Jesus did not strike anyone dead, even evil psychopaths, and complained the people who asked him to strike people dead. Peter didn't know what to say. He didn't look a thing like Jesus. You were his disciple, the father spat, half grief-stricken and half disgusted. 
Who was this pretender? Can you please just resurrect my daughter? First, I'm not the pretender. Simon Magus is the pretender, and I'm about ready to fight a magic battle with him. Also, fine. If this guy wanted his daughter alive so badly, he'd let the man have his daughter. What a selfish man completely opposed to the plans of God, who enjoyed striking down Christians so they'd go to heaven. A few days later, the girl ran off with a slave and was never seen again. Peter thought that this was very funny. I told you, he waved his finger in the gardener's face. Peter was a terrible dude. Also, remember that this Acts of Peter is trying to write him as the hero. They had a really weird idea of heroes back then. Peter and Paul then do a quick team up with a paralyzed woman cheating on her husband, preach to the people, who are terrified that there's more where that came from, and walk through crowds of women kissing their feet until Peter stops off at Rome. He finds the church there in a state of confusion. A guy named Simon has been telling everyone that he is totally Jesus, despite the fact that many of the Christians had seen Jesus and Simon looked absolutely nothing like him. He also told people that he had the power of flight which he demonstrated by flying over the city gate, disappearing, and reappearing in the middle of the crowd. This got basically everyone to worship him, except for a Christian named Narcissus. Isn't that a name from Greek mythology, Peter asked, for someone who is really full of themselves? I'm not a narcissist, and my name is absolutely not from Greek mythology. It's a totally common name which has never been cursed by the mythology of any other religion. I have literally the best name of all time, Narcissus said. Peter preached a quick sermon and convinced most of the church that Simon was a fake, and they suggested a dark magic battle between Peter and Simon. That's about what I would have suggested too, seeing as I might get the chance to see Peter one-up the ridiculousness of this already ridiculous fanfiction. And that is exactly what he's about to do, but that will be right after this. Peter gathered his things and started walking determinedly to the house of Marcellus, where Simon was staying. The other believers kept harping on the fact that Marcellus was so smart and gave all of his stuff away and was so trustworthy that it was completely his fault that they were deceived by Simon. This was ridiculous. Religion was between one person and God, and God gave sufficient evidence to people to keep them from being deceived. God literally had warned them not to be deceived by evil miracle workers. The believers looked embarrassed, but they persisted. If our smartest friend jumps off a cliff, we'll do it too, they said. Seriously? Wasn't this a basic principle taught by mothers since time immemorial? If one of your friends jumps off a cliff, you do not do it. The believers hadn't heard that before. It was all this guy's fault that they'd gotten deceived. Peter was furious. He launched into a massive exposition talking about all the ways the devil could trick people in elaborate and flowery language. And quote, Thou didst enmesh the first man in concupiscence, and bind him with thine old iniquity, and with the chain of the flesh. Thou art the holy, the exceeding bitter fruit of the tree of bitterness, who sinnest diverse lusts upon men. The people didn't understand this. Could he just get on with the magic battle? Not until I list the names of tons of people who have been convinced to commit sin, call down curses on the devil, and wish for him to be cut off from the church. But, isn't that redundant? The believers were confused. The church already held the devil in pretty low regard. Why would Peter wish that the devil was cast out of the church? Peter just wanted to make sure that he told everyone how much he hated the devil. He wanted to be clear, seeing as his actions up to this point had seemed to be on the side of the devil. No, paralyzing your daughter so she can't have sex and dropping people dead is totally okay, the believer said. Just get on with the fight. But seriously, the believers kept on pushing Peter to start fighting this guy and wanted him to stop with all the flowery language. All right, 
Peter held up his hand and the crowd became completely silent. You could hear a pin drop. You're about to see something really cool. Just get on with it. The believers were exasperated. Enough with all this announcing. Peter gestured toward a ferocious dog bound with a thick chain and the chain snapped. The crowd gasped and drew back in horror, but they didn't need to worry. Peter, servant of the, quote, unspeakable and living God, what do you want me to do? Was the dog talking? It was absolutely talking. Peter told the dogs to go in the house, insult Simon, and tell him to come out. Simon stopped what he was saying, but Marcellus immediately realized that he had been deceived and came rushing out of the house, falling before Peter and groveling, asking that his sins could be forgiven, setting up a statue with the inscription to the new god, Simon, after just meeting a guy, had absolutely been a bad idea. He'd sacrifice his money, his kids, whatever, to the, quote, most sweet Peter, if only Peter would forgive him. This guy, Simon, is where we get the word simony from, Peter explained. Simony is when you give your money to get salvation. Offering your money proves to me that you're still deceived by this guy instead of just asking forgiveness from God. Although, to be fair, Marcellus was asking forgiveness from the very erratic Peter. Just kidding. Peter did not say this. He forgave Marcellus very quickly so he could get on with the battling Simon. Just then, somebody started laughing. It was obvious that this person was possessed by a demon, seeing as nobody would be laughing if they weren't controlled by an agent of Satan. Show yourself, Peter demanded. A young man immediately ran out of the building, slammed himself into the wall, and said, Simon and the dog are arguing. Simon was trying to convince the magically controlled dog to tell Peter that he wasn't there. Peter and the rest of the people took this in stride and focused on the young man possessed by the demon who was smashing a statue of Caesar. Despite not being freaked out by talking dogs and demon-possessed people, they were absolutely terrified that this statue had been broken and begged Peter to fix it, who told Marcellus to sprinkle water on the statue of Caesar and repair the thing. Now that was over with. They could still hear Simon and the dog arguing. The dog kept on insulting Simon and explaining that, seeing as he knew Simon was getting his power from the demons, he wasn't going to go tell Peter that Simon wasn't there. How stupid could he be? The guy literally paralyzed his own daughter, the dog explained. Meanwhile, the people were begging Peter for another miracle. Despite the fact that when people begged Jesus for more miracles, Jesus told them, absolutely not, Peter was very excited to show his power. Simon did a lot of miracles, and that's why we believe him. So now, you do a lot of miracles, the perfectly logical crowd said. What if someone comes along, aided by demons, and does even more miracles than me, Peter questioned. They'd probably follow him, they admitted. This story was probably written when the Catholic Church had banned the reading of the Bible, and the people were completely reliant on hearing other people's words for their salvation. The author never thought about the option that people could access the words of God for themselves and prevent themselves from being deceived. Peter wasn't about to correct them. He wanted a full-on magic battle. Peter saw the dog walking toward him, praising Peter and God. Peter said very coldly, I have no further use for you. And the dog dropped dead. The people gasped. That was really horrible and cruel. The dog, for God's sake, were not that evil. Just cut Simon's head off. Just kidding. This was great and exciting. They hadn't seen drama like this since Simon was doing magic. Could Peter do more? Yes, absolutely. Yes, he could. Peter looked at a dried herring that was on Marcellus's kitchen table, summoned it to his hand, and set it in the water, where it immediately started swimming again. This got Peter a ton of attention, and everyone came from miles around to see the herring. Marcellus, meanwhile, went inside with his servants to beat Simon up, who, despite being able to do tons of magic tricks, was completely susceptible to being beaten with fists, sticks, 
stones, and getting buckets of waste dumped on his head. Yuck. Simon was finally able to escape the house and ran directly to Peter, apparently thinking he could still take him. Peter immediately mind-controlled a baby to speak in a deep voice, insulting Simon and striking him speechless. Isn't that a bit of an unethical use of our baby, the parents said? They didn't like how this battle was spilling over into dogs and kids. At least I didn't kill your baby after I'd finished with it, Peter reminded them. They shut up. Peter was a loose cannon. Simon, now deciding that facing Peter outright was a bad idea, used magic to take a woman's gold. The woman started torturing her servants, thinking they had taken the gold and not realizing that Simon had done it. When Peter found out about it, he prayed and told the woman that Simon's servants were about to do a very amateur move and try to sell her something that they had made out of the stolen gold. Wow, the woman said. This guy is written as either laughably incompetent or obnoxiously arrogant. The woman tipped off the governor, who tortured the men until they had admitted that Simon paid them to steal the money. In the meantime, Marcellus was washing his house to make sure that not one particle of dust that had touched Simon remained in his house. That's overkill, some of the believers said. You don't literally have to get every single bit of dust out of the house. Marcellus disagreed. He was proving that he was absolutely faithful. At this point, Peter went to visit Marcellus and healed a blind widow that was staying in his house. But when other blind widows asked to be healed, Peter shook his head. He let them see for a few minutes, but why waste his magic on them? Peter was a jerk. He was also a little nervous about his next encounter with Simon. Don't worry, Marcellus said. I had a dream last night. About what? Peter queried. Just a heads up, this is going to be pretty racist. About a black woman in chains, dancing. You told me that that was the spirit of Simon and told me to cut her in pieces, so I did. Peter could have made pretty much any response at this point that would have been better than the one he did. Something like, that's racist, or I wouldn't ever tell you to cut a woman in pieces, but that wasn't Peter's response. Peter was filled with courage and was joyful and refreshed. Peter then went before the Romans, despite the Bible saying never to go to non-religious people for advice on religious matters, and asked them to decide whether Simon or him were telling the truth. Simon told Peter that the Romans were very smart, trying to butter up the judges, before saying that Jesus was absolutely not God. A lot of people responded by telling Simon that he was right. Peter decided that the virgin birth and the biblical prophecies would prove great evidence to the Romans, who absolutely did not believe in either, and for some reason the Romans thought that this was sufficient evidence to put Simon to death, and then asked Peter to bring Simon back to life. They apparently did not think about the fact that if Peter was a fraud and Simon was telling the truth, this was a horrible plan. They didn't get that far, though. The prefect pointed at one of the young men standing next to him and instructed him to restrain Simon. Simon immediately summoned all his dark magic and dropped the boy instantly. His mother started crying. That was her boy. She didn't want him to be collateral damage in this magic battle. Why hadn't Simon instantly killed Peter instead? The crowd had agreed. This had gone too far. Yeah, not only was Peter killing a dog not a big deal, it was absolutely great. But killing a boy? That wasn't cool. Simon sighed. These people were being too critical of him. He just needed a practice dummy, that's all. The Roman prefect jumped in. He really liked this boy. He could have had Simon kill some boys that he liked less, but for some reason, this one was a good one to use as a test dummy. Simon asked the people if they'd kicked Peter out of the city if he... Simon was able to raise this boy from the dead. Absolutely, the people said. We'll also burn him at the stake. That's not an acceptable punishment in this day and age. We punish people in arguably even more cruel ways. The author shrugged. He wrote this fan fiction in a time when burning at the stake was a terrible punishment, and he hadn't done much period research. 
The boy immediately lifted his head and bowed to Simon, then laid back down. Immediately, the people decided they'd burn Peter to death, but Peter silenced them with a logical argument. This is a boy. Boys are usually running around. If this guy was raised from the dead, wouldn't he stand up? That was absolutely true. Why were they so ready to believe Simon? Peter then raises a couple people from the dead just for good measure, including the boy who Simon killed, as well as some dead people who just happened to be in the area. That was convenient, the Roman prefect said. Although, knowing the character of Peter as it is written in this story, I wouldn't be surprised if Peter killed them just to raise them from the dead. This story does not treat Peter well, although it thinks it's treating him very well. At this point, people started worshiping Peter as a god, and despite the fact that throughout the Bible there was a theme that both people, including Peter himself, and even angels, refused to allow people to worship them, Peter was apparently cool with it. In the canonical Bible, whenever people tried to worship Peter, he'd stop them and say he was only a human himself. Apocryphal Peter has no such humility. Apparently forgetting the plan to kill whoever lost the magic battle, Both Peter and Simon left the presence of the prefect alive. Simon, then, despite not being able to do many magic tricks before the prefect, started doing magic all throughout the city, healing lame people, healing blind people, making spirits walk through houses, and various other tricks, but Peter kept following him around and undoing his magic and proving his tricks to be false. Simon was exasperated. Okay, guys, he began. I am a god, and I'm sick of being rejected. Tomorrow, I'm going home to my father. Come and watch. So tons of people, including knights, which absolutely didn't exist at this point in history. Come on! I really worked hard on creating a genuine period piece. And plenty of believers and Romans came to watch as well. Everyone stood breathless, and Simon stood on top of the city gate, waving his hands and making magical incantations. Peter stood there, watching Simon to see what would happen and preparing to humiliate him. There was a shriek, and an airborne chariot came madly rushing through the sky, pulled by six demons, all furiously shrieking and howling as they came closer to Simon. At least that's what Peter saw. But, being demons, they were able to alter their appearance and not be seen by the crowd because this crowd saw Simon lift up into the air, arms outstretched as he loudly proclaimed, I am Jesus Christ. Everyone looked at Peter to see what he would do, and Peter began to pray, asking that Simon fall from the sky, but not die, just break his leg in three places. The demons howled. This was absolutely not what they had expected, despite the fact that they were flying through an assembly of Christians. They tried to beat their wings faster in terror, but they found they couldn't, and now they were falling to the ground at an immense speed. With a crack, Simon hit the ground and broke his leg in three places. Although Simon had been shown up many times before, this was the straw that broke the camel's back, and everyone started ridiculing him. If he couldn't protect his own leg from being broken, how could he be a true god? Following him was ridiculous. Oh, thank goodness, Simon sighed. Two of his friends, physicians, were coming to carry him away, to some place far away where he would never see Peter again, and he could maybe continue with his delusions. One of the physicians pulled out a knife. Wait, what are you doing with that? Simon started to worry a little bit. The physician pressed the knife against Simon's skin. Simon was terrified. He hadn't asked for this. The physicians went on to cut Simon in pieces. Because every villain in medieval stories needs an extremely disturbing and violent end. And that's how Simon died. And that was the end of Simon, the dark sorcerer. 
Peter was very famous for the next few days, but maybe a little too famous because a lot of women listened to his message to avoid sex and stopped having sex with their husbands. These women were the wives of powerful Roman officials, and these officials conspired together to stop this apostle from ruining their sex lives. The husbands thought that putting Peter to death was the way to stop his teaching from spreading and worked together to get him condemned to death by crucifixion. Peter then asked to be crucified upside down, for which he gave such an elaborate and confusing reason that I couldn't really understand it. Regardless, a lot of Christians believe that Peter was crucified upside down, but remember that this fan fiction is where they get it. Yes, this is the earliest source reporting that Peter asked to be crucified upside down. I'm not writing off the idea that he may have been crucified upside down, but I think that this is a majorly ridiculous and unreliable source. Peter, while being crucified, gave a huge analogy of Jesus turning things on their heads when he came to earth, how the middle bar of the cross represented the nature of man, and all sorts of complicated analogies that just continue to baffle me. We've never had a crucified criminal talk so much, but okay, the Roman said. We may be terrible people for crucifying people, but at least we're not as draconian as executioners from the Middle Ages who silence the sacred words of the dying. This about ends the story. Peter, after his death, appears to Marcellus, and God talks to Nero, who is apparently mad that Peter was killed, and tells him to stop persecuting Christians. Nero decides it is a great idea to listen to God and stops persecuting Christians, but for all practical purposes, the body of the story is over with the death of Peter. I really bit off more than I could chew with this episode, and I hope it doesn't come through too much in the form of choppiness in the story. In retrospect, it would have been better as a two-parter, but I was just super excited to tell the whole story. Honestly, I really dislike this book. It portrays Peter in a very negative light, but somehow he's still the hero of the story. It is extremely misogynistic, racist, and shows complete disregard for animal life, and really to some extent human life, as humans are just pawns for Peter and Simon. Yeah, Peter does raise some people from the dead, but he also completely refuses to heal some widows because he doesn't want to waste his powers on them, and it doesn't advance his purposes. I have respect for a lot of different religions and sacred texts, but this book is completely different. The values it puts forward are the complete opposite of those put forth in the Bible and taught by the biblical Peter, and I am even more skeptical of the authenticity of the book because it mentions such things as knights that are very anachronistic with the time that the book is supposedly written in. I know I said that I wouldn't give any evaluation on these stories, so I'm going to stop here. I've already recorded the next several episodes, so know that this is a very rare occurrence. That's it for this week. Sometime, we'll get to the Apocalypse of Peter, which is like an amateur version of Dante's Inferno, but that won't be for a little while. I've got a lot of other stories to tell, and I've had about all that I can handle of these type of apocryphal books for a while. If you haven't already, check out the other bonus episode on Dinah, which is much shorter, as well as this week's main episode on Tobit. If you've already listened to all of them, tune back in next Monday to listen to the second part of the story of Tobit. Trust me, things really get good. For questions, comments, and feedback, please feel free to send me an email at talesfromsacredtexts at gmail.com. That's talesfromsacredtexts at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. You guys are what makes this show possible, and I'm so grateful. If you really liked it, please leave a review and subscribe, and from time to time I'll try to do some shoutouts for subscribers who send me emails requesting one. Scripting was done by myself, Caleb Howard, and music was by myself and by Anchor Podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you next week.